Controversial subjects with the facts can be tense, but we are a sub science here to make things make sense. Nick Pelleggi, we're so glad to have you here to teach us everything we could possibly ever want to know about <laughs> houseplants and plant care. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. I think I discovered your YouTube channel. I know you have like an Instagram where you share lots of your plants and pictures and stuff as well, but I feel like it's been pandemic vibes for me because I, since the pandemic, have been more interested obviously in plants. I feel like a lot of people have. Have you found that interest or viewership has generally been up since the pandemic? 100%. I will not lie. It was actually kind of funny when like the pandemic hit. I feel like my like worst months were like March and April, like in like the whole time I was doing YouTube and then suddenly like May hit and I think that's like when the boom hit. So that was like my <laughs> best month. The like, when everyone was like, okay, I can't last any longer. I need some plants and I need some advice on plants. <laughs> yeah, it was like two months in, everyone just got like hit with that and it was just- A little every... spring energy. <laughs> exactly. They need to look after their children, their children that don't need that much work. <laughs> exactly. Before, okay, wait, before we berate you with like too many questions I, about plants, which were, where they're coming, I want, can you give us a little summary of like what you do on YouTube? What's your background in plants? Like, and yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I mean, so on YouTube, I literally just kind of sit and ramble about plants that's literally the only thing I do on my channel I try to you know <laughs> I'm not educated in the sense of like a college education I have all of my uh, learning from experience which I think is very important when it comes to house plants in specific as a botanist you would have to of course have the education but just as a simple house plant grower really the best thing is experience so no I don't have any um, education, like I said, but I worked for a long time. Well, a long time for a 26 year old. So I worked there for two and a half years, but it was- You're only 26, you're a baby. <laughs> um, I worked as a plant buyer at a local house plant shop and I learned a lot there. I made some incredible relationships that I'm sure I will still hold in the future as I start my own journey in that uh, part of my life. But um, I do want to open my own store one day, but you know, the pandemic's going okay. on, so. Did you that always over. know that you were into plants like before you worked there? No, well, you know, yes and no. So I grew up gardening, outdoor gardening with my father and uh, we never had houseplants. I remember when we would go like buy the outdoor gardening stuff, I would see houseplants and I'd be like, I want that, can we grow that? And they'd be like, no, the cats are gonna pee in it. So we just <laughs> never had houseplants ever. And it, I actually didn't even get into houseplants until after I like brought back outdoor gardening into my life indoors. So I started doing an herb garden in my home in college and my neighbor who actually ended up being a future roommate another story for another day but <laughs> she came to my apartment for the first time and the first thing she said was why don't you have any house plants and I was like I don't know so I went and then it was a slippery slope from there um, ended up starting this YouTube channel kind of as a way to get my foot in the door since I didn't have any education so um, I was at like a dead-end job let's say at a bar and I was very much looking to get out of it so that was my stepping stone into working at the houseplant shop and then from there I was able to you know really hone in on what I wanted to do and then that's why now I'm doing full-time at home so I absolutely love it how, how many plants do you have <sighs> In okay. your home. I haven't counted in a little bit. I would, it's more than 450. I, what? Uh, <laughs> I hope Wait, not Wait, are you serious? Yes. I'm, I would oh. be like upset if it was at 500. I feel like that's a little too much, but. Uh, I love oh that God. justification for yourself. <laughs> like 400, oh, 450, totally thank goodness. Normal. 100, now that'd be wild. <laughs> Oh yeah. my god. Okay, <laughs> and over the course of how long have you collected those plants and how many have died along the way? <laughs> so I started when I was 20 back when I was in college and like I said I'm 26 now so it's been about six years and um, a lot I'd say more than I have currently have died but like I said that's where you learn the most. I think a lot of people like kick themselves so hard about killing their plants but I'm like no that's how you learn but that might also be because plants like a lot of plants collector plants cost a lot of money so people might be like killing their like $250 philodendron and that's something to kick yourself over Whoa. but you know if you start off with just like a little $4 Pop right. Okay, wait. Two hundred fifty dollars. I have never spent that on a house plant. <laughs> I which, haven't either. Which one is that? Like, what is that? Why is it so much? Well, there's a bunch of house plants that have currently just like skyrocketed, and this is something that really has only happened since like 
March, April, May of last year, as we were talking about with the whole houseplant boom. So um, there are a couple, the most notable ones that like are like most well known for being expensive would be the pink princess philodendron, which is like a pink variegated plant, which is kind of silly in my opinion, because there's plenty of other pink plants out there. But this is one plant people are like, I'm going to spend <laughs> top dollar. I thought I sold it inexpensive when I worked at the houseplant store for $125. But, oh um, my gosh, and a, how big is it? A little tiny four inch like plants like oh, uh, like wait I, I don't have like a good example around me here but like three little leaves oh, <laughs> oh my gosh oh my i God. love that i did not know that because i don't like when i shop for houseplants i don't i'm not versed enough to know like i'm more talking about like environment or whatever like i'm not no but like there is actually like <laughs> one day i might be like what about that one and they'll be like 125 <laughs> smackeronies <laughs> like <sighs> little baby that's birds. so <laughs> weird so there's trends there's there is trends, trends that and that's something people hate but it's just like it's it's something that exists it trends exist in everything so it's just something but i do want to mention too there is another house plant that it's a variegated monstera i don't know if you guys are familiar with like the classic swiss cheese yeah, plant or monstera. they kind of have like the holes in them yeah, yeah. oh so yes, yeah. yes 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 the variegated version of that sells for like over a thousand dollars and if you get like a different sport which is just like a different version of the plant like maybe it's got yellow variegation or i found one when i was working at the house plant store with green variegation and those kinds of plants would sell for like over two thousand, three thousand, maybe even four thousand oh, dollars. Okay, wild. <laughs> we need like a best in show type movie about <laughs> people like trying to figure out how to like find or like maybe there's like some sort of like you know financial like drug lord energy to these plants. That's so interesting. That's so expensive. So I don't get it either. Like I am in deep, as you know. I like am surrounded <laughs> by plants. This is what I do. But I've never spent more than a hundred dollars on a plant before. Yeah, I don't think I could because of that fear of killing it. Mm -hmm. Like, just I, like, not even fear, but just like, you know, like, that's such a, like, the stakes are so high. I Maybe know. if it was huge. Because even you've said yourself, like, as a plant, someone who knows a lot about them, like, it's not inevitable that, like, you will still end up killing plants because, like, the environment might not be right or X, Y, Z. So it is like, even when you're so experienced, there's still a risk that that plant's going to die that's cost you thousands of dollars absolutely these are things that should be grown in botanical gardens the home is the worst place to grow house plants think about it it's not outside it's not a tropical environment like you can put them outside for the summer like i have a couple house plants i'll put outside for the summer that need a little bit more attention or i'll put things inside glass enclosures or like cloches to cover them up to give them more of that greenhouse effect but um no all these plants that people are dropping like a bunch thousands of dollars on these are things that should be grown in like botanical collections Oh okay, God. questions. Here we go. <laughs> what would you say are the main issues you see when people try to keep can uh, plants alive? So it's like, what are your sort of go-to like don'ts? Like, don't do this, don't do that. Before we get into the do's. Yeah, I mean, the the two most important things I would say are light and water. I would say always more light than you would expect because, like I said, the home is the worst environment. Like our windows mm. are really the only space that you should be growing house plants. <laughs> but you see behind me, with all these plants are literally illuminated by grow lights, which is how they grow. They're, if I didn't have a grow light there, the plants would just wither away. Um, so more light mm. than you would expect, and then less water than you would expect too. In the same time, mm. so like more light and then less water than you would think of course that's you know subjective because like ferns do not want a lot of light and they want a lot of water so there's like of course things but i would say my rule of thumb when i get a plant if i'm worried about it i just make sure i'm giving it enough light from a window and i'm not overwatering it okay that's so interesting because i think recently i had a pretty good track record with house plants and then recently bought a bunch uh, pandemic energy. The way of like, <laughs> no, I did, but I guess what everyone else did. And I think I killed three from overwatering, which I'd never done before because I was just watering every Sunday. And I think what happened is it was right when winter came. So is that a, that's a serious thing we have to think about is when winter comes, you hold back watering. I think that's what happened. Yes, um, there are a couple plants if we're getting to like the nitty gritty that are winter active and some that are more summer active. Um, that's more with like in succulents that are more winter active. It's like they're absorbing all of that summer energy and hot sun, but exactly that um, nine times out of 10, you want to water less in the winter time because it's just going to get cold and wet roots and wet feet and nobody wants that so how like how much less on average like what do you do when winter comes like do you really well that's back? 
it, it, it's once again it's like different because I have south facing windows in my home so the sun is so low in the sky that my plants dry out so much quicker in the winter time as well as the fact that the heat kicks on and the humidity kind of drops because of that so it is once again something very subjective but if you just live I mean like I've all my other apartments that I've ever lived in with houseplants was not like this and I would say on average if I was watering a plant once a week in the summertime I'd be watering it probably every two weeks but once again okay. it is all subjective how oh my gosh on okay earth do you keep track of watering your Almost five, <laughs> not, not 500. Not but, quite 500. But somewhere <laughs> under 500 plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at this point, I feel like we have like this like symbiotic language where they like speak to me <laughs> and they tell me when it's time. But when I was in my first couple of years, I kept a spreadsheet and I kept the spreadsheet that would wow. say the scientific name of the plant, the common name of the plant. Uh, when I got it, just because I liked to know that, because, you know, these things add up fast yeah, sometimes. Keep track, yeah. And then, of course, when I last watered and when I last fertilized. Oh, wow. my God. Organization station yeah, over here. I do not. I do not. I mean, you're helping me with an experiment that people will be able to see pretty soon. Um, and I, so I was like managing 10 plants and barely having to manage them because they were in complete darkness. That was the whole point. But I still was just like, wait, I can't keep track. This is too many. I cannot imagine having that many plants. I would uh, love to have that many plants if they could magically take care of themselves. Yeah, well, you just have to get them to speak to you, Mitch, and That's tell true. them that. What it's not as much work as you think. Like, I swear. <laughs> I, I mean, I probably have like one day a week where I spend like an hour Ma maximum okay. like going around but just like watering nice. everything but like I said a lot of these plants like can visually like look droopy or a lot of them I call it my taco test which I should trademark but um, it's where <laughs> you would take a leaf and you would like f try to fold it up like I'll grab this little like Hoya right here and do you want to try to fold the leaf up I don't I know it's so dark you can barely see but if I was trying to fold the leaf up like a hard yeah. taco shell if this plant was to need water, um, Hoyas, Peperomias are ones that I use a lot of these for, and those are plants that are very prevalent in my home. Um, I know once it would fold up without breaking that it's like time to water it because it okay. would lack the succulents from being dry. So that's like oh. my surefire way to know I'm not going to overwater them without having to stick my finger in the soil or like really do anything other than just right. Oh my God, so leaf. folding it and it doesn't like brown. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't like, you know, I can tell with that Hoya, yeah, yeah, I couldn't no, but that's kind of like tell. not what I immediately yeah. thought you were going to say, because actually the fact that it would like more quote unquote break is showing that it's like full of water and has, is more yeah. like robust and mm -hmm. like turgid. And plants oh, like my Hoyas God. and Pepperoni cool. is like want to be dry. So if, if you overwater the pepperoni? them, it's like, What's like, the pepperoni? <laughs> <laughs> the pepperoni? Imagine <laughs> we were like, those aren't plants, that's pepperoni. Yes, <laughs> yes they're... <laughs> I love that. I would hear that Imagine a lot of the house Imagine we all just store. found out that like pepperoni <laughs> grew on plants. <laughs> we were like, oh, it's vegetarian. Yeah. Well, pepperomias are in the peppercorn family. So they're okay. very. Oh, yes. okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Like, Your face is in... so mad when I said pepperoni. Like, I fucking heard <laughs> I'm this sorry. From every it's like things that you hear all the time back when I was in the industry. So. That's oh, yeah. so <laughs> like all those so jokes. smart. There's all those like TikToks of people who have to like work at um, any retail store or grocery stores and hear the same jokes like constantly over. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> I have a, a question that's based on my study for today. Okay, yeah. So I have been I, I sort of am minus you helping Mitch with these plants been I'm sort of the plant guy in oh, the yeah. home that's the premise of the video yeah I've never <laughs> yeah. taken care of a plant in my life I need like <laughs> the lowest maintenance plant please and in a pandemic with lots of free time and some might argue lots of depression I've been <laughs> petting my plants like I like I water them and then I uh, stroke them maybe there's some weed involved some sism music is playing and of I like course. try to like I think I'm helping them by touching them to take the dust off because I had read somewhere at some point, I think once, and this is what I'm challenging today, this concept that the dust grows on these house plants, and so you need to take the, the dust off so that photosynthesis can happen more effectively. So I like to now do it leaf Century. by leaf. <laughs> so then I was reading this week about a study about touch signaling within plants. This was the tail cress, which isn't a house plant, but... It was really cool. So it was about how like plants actually respond 
to mechanical stimulation, which is touch. It has a cool name, Thig Thigmomorphogenesis, which is like... That's like what they do when someone touches them? Yeah, what, it's the they... name of the process of chemical cell signaling that happens when oh. they're touched. And it can induce a stress response, which will actually slow down growth. And so this study, what they did is they touched um, the specific tail crest also known as Arabidopsis thaliana. That's its pepperoni name. <laughs> <laughs> they touched it um, with a paintbrush, a specific leaves, and they'd test it 30 minutes after, one hour after, three, hour, three hours after, and six hours after. And they did find that this like uh, chemical stress response was highest at 30 minutes after. It would slow down growth. It would have a mitochondrial functional cell signaling that would essentially make it seem like the plant was like, getting ready for a perceived pathogen attack. Oh and then I was like, wait, sh am I? <laughs> okay, should, should not I not be touching these plants? And like, I, here I am thinking I'm having a moment with them, but they're actually <laughs> screaming like, um, there's, you're literally trying to attack us, we hate you. So I'm, I, I know that like, this is a wild plant, so it's not gonna have to deal with that issue of dust most likely, cause there's wind and all these other factors in the wild. So what is your like thought process around cleaning touching these plants versus not yeah well that's that's fun that you say that there are um house plants that do respond to touch and it's like negative like it's their way of like uh protecting themselves really? so the most uh popular one would be like the sensitive plant which is the mimosa tree if you guys have heard of that i want one so is bad i've been going all over touch them? yeah <laughs> yes. and you can't get them well I don't bother it's They're, like an exotic plant it's a waste right? of money the, I mean, wait, the, okay, wait, why? There's like, I've always wanted this plant and I've been, I've been calling different places and like Instagram DMing and they're all like, we don't get them. Like you have to come quick when they come in. They're $2,000. That's why. No, they're, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they would cost like 15. So wait, oh. why, why are they overrated? They respond to touch. Well, I mean, that's the, they are tree sap or like saplings or seedlings. I don't know what the correct word is, but um, they uh, are just not suitable house plants. They are just uh, kind oh. of for fun. Like in my experience, it dies easily and it gets, it's very, because it's not really a house plant, they're like extremely susceptible to pests. So it's like a magnet mm. and they just like come out of nowhere from like through the really? vents and like the cracks in the windows. So that's just wow. my experience with plants like that. But not only that, it's like, you touch it and it reacts and that's the whole thing that you want to do but you're like you're not supposed to do that I had a manager when I worked at the plant <laughs> store and he would like yell at people and be like stop touching the sensitive plant oh my god you're like yeah it's panicking it's, like, it's literally the best of your response that's so funny it's like you're abusing the plant <laughs> yeah, but to the cleaning aspect, it is something that I've noticed. Um, there are some plants, uh, specifically the ones that seem to have like larger leaves um, and the thicker leaves. Like I have um, a ficus elastica, which is um, a rubber tree. And like if I like, I have it literally in like my walkway and I'll like walk by it and like the leaves get like damaged and that's something I don't like. And I think that happens with like my ficus liratas that I used to grow as well. So it's just kind of something that they don't yeah. respond well to it. But ficus are very like finicky plants, but they're also very popular. So just so, so do you, but are you conscious of the dust? Like, is that a yes. myth that I've created? No, that is a thing. Yeah, I dust my plants probably not as much as I should because of the sheer quantity, but um, I do just take like a, dry paper towel and then I'll just like give them a quick wipe and then I'll get a damp one afterwards just so I'm not like caking the dust on there but that's just because it's a me problem because I don't dust them very often so it's usually like a whole layer of dust a layer. okay yeah but um n you know with houseplants nine times out of ten I would say it's not really an issue I'd say it's just like specific ones like I was saying like the sensitive plant's not gonna like it and the ficus that I grow don't seem to really like it and they just get like ugly looking Wow, that's so interesting. Because yeah, now I've started to think about it as I touch them. I'm like it's oh, probably a trade-off too. You're like fine. even if you're, I doubt you're hurting them that much. And even if you are causing a stress response, you're also helping them in what, like in a way that they are indoor plants, they're gonna get dust, they can't. So no, them. what else this study found was that the stress response would decrease the more they did it. So this, the plant actually like to adapted to it. Oh. And that's another question I have is that our fig you told me once that you're supposed to shake the stem because it's well, like... Well, I didn't, like, tell you. I just was <laughs> oh. like, I saw, I saw someone say that on Yeah, sorry, like, <laughs> shaking the stem. But it, but to me, it made, like, sense from a scientific perspective because it, this plant would be out in the wild where there would be wind. And then that shaking, apparently, the thought behind it is that thickens it the thickens stem. the stem. Yeah. And is it true? is, like, 
a more realistic interpretation of the outdoors. Is that true? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, from a scientific point, I don't really know, but I would say that sounds kind of overkill to shake the trunk. I I was doing it for weeks. (laughs) Well, what shake. I would do is, what I, in my bedroom, um, we have two cats. My roommate's cat likes to chew on some of my plants, so I keep a lot of plants in my bedroom with the door closed, and I keep a fan on in there. And so the plant leaves are always moving, and I feel like that kind of like simulates like, simul- yeah, what you're that's, talking yeah. about. Okay. Yeah, because so, I don't like the fig leaf is ever like being aggressively shaken. In no, and figs know, are not. so <laughs> finicky. I feel like you would just like knock the leaves off. They would just pop. It's like I said, if you just like touch them, like literally, we just had a couple leaves pop off recently because we just are always walking by it and it's just oh my like, gosh oh my. i'm panicked about this study about touch made me freak out this weekend i've been really rubbing down our fig because i'm like this is you know <laughs> this is an this is an accent piece in our home and now i'm like some of the plants are falling off and i'm like is it because i'm petting it too much like oh my gosh it's so stressful oh, but wait. also very calming <laughs> <laughs> yes oh my gosh okay you have two cats do you have to worry about them eating the plants at all um so my cat that the plants came first the cat came second and she's actually right here oh my goodness hello sweet oh Kate. hi oh. she's heard. a little teeny black cat her name is Muffin, as you but say I use the plants boots. came first the she's cat like, came second <laughs> <laughs> she's listening she's so good she does not mess with the plants at all she like just doesn't even seem to notice them. my roommate's cat does seem to notice them though um the plants that I keep around aren't like fatal. I have like two euphorbias, which are like the most poisonous plants I have in my home. They're shoved in like the back corner of my windows, like they can't get to them. Um, okay. He will like chew on. I'm like looking around to see. Uh, he'll chew on like I have like a monstera that he'll like chew on occasionally, but because they're just like small nibbles, it's not really gonna like. I don't have to take them to the vet. I don't have to worry about it. Like they have calcium oxalates in the leaves, which are like these. I'm sure you guys know more than me, but like they're like little glass shards that are basically oh. in. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, I didn't well, know there was glass shards in any of the yeah, plants. Yeah, so they're like mi- microscopic glass shards in like the sap. Wow. So that's like what's not good about the like cats or animals getting it in their mouth. And they usually learn pretty quickly. Like that's not something I should eat. Some of them are pretty relentless though. So like if the plant the cat ate like a whole like branch of, of philodendron, <laughs> it would probably throw up. It would probably throw up a couple yeah. times. Yeah. It probably isn't going to die because it's not like a fatal instance. It's just its stomach is going to be irritated as well as it's not right. so it just might seem but i'm not saying <laughs> please take care of your cats people like, yeah don't freak out on this like, podcast <laughs> don't freak out like the cat's gonna be okay if you're terrified take it to the vet but um i keep on the floor like pet safe plants like i have calatheas on the floor and denver is like a magnet to, I'm at, my, her name his name's denver so uh he's like a magnet and he'll just like chew the whole circumference of the leaves and it looks like crap but <laughs> One day he'll be gone and the plant will have its time to shine. Oh my god. Well, I she's moving out like... this year, not that he's going to die. Oh, oh <laughs> one day this cat's going to croak and yeah. die and then the plant and will I'll be fine. I'll finally be able to It'll like, come back and thrive plants. after the death of this mammal. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, no. I'm I'm still in awe of like how many plants you I I guess like actually we don't we have a good amount now, especially since the pandemic. And you do a really good job of it. Oh my god, but it's next to 450. It's like Oh yeah, next to 450. No, tiny honestly, family. I think more than one is a lot to take care of. So Okay. Yeah. Why well, thank you. Well, what like where would you start with somebody? If somebody was like I'm a new plant, I want to get into house plants, where do I start? Well, that's a good question because I would want to know first of all like their home environment as well as their like temperament, like I would always recommend a ZZ plant because I always say if you water it uh, more than you pay your rent, it's too much. But some people want to water a house plant more than they pay their rent. So that might not be a good (laughs) example. Although it's indestructible, it just might not be what some people are looking for. Because you could you could overwater that plant. Anyway. Well, you could, yeah. If you wanted to water something every day, like I would dare yeah. to say, maybe you should grow a fern because you know it's something <laughs> I don't want to grow because it would just fall in the mess of my plants and I'd find a dried yeah. up piece of trash one day. But um, <laughs> so you know, everyone's different, but it really just definitely depends on what the lighting conditions are in their home as well as mm-hmm. their temperament, like I said. Like who they are. Oh, wait, yeah. I have a question about potting. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Potting. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Potting. Okay, so I have this idea that you have your plant that you buy. It's in its little plastic container. And I'm always like, okay, so I'm going to buy something at least sort of double the size. 
mm-hmm. as a pot that I'm going to put it in. And my concept is that the roots are going to expand. This is going to allow it to grow and thrive. And I never really think anything about it, whether it being smaller or bigger. And I found that a couple plants that have died that I think from overwatering, it was almost like the roots never got into the potting soil. It was like, they just kind of like, it, it felt like when they eventually died and it pulled out the root system. I'm like, why didn't these roots go anywhere? <laughs> like they didn't go into the soil. Is there any tips you have about potting to either make sure those roots actually get into that extra soil that you've put in or like ways to think about it? Cause that's just the way I thought about it. And it didn't seem to work recently for me for some reason. Yeah. I mean, all plants are different. Um, if you're working with a plant that has a little bit more of like a meaty root system, like the ZZ plant or like a pothos, um, these are things that you could probably go maybe like two inches in diameter larger with the pot uh, that you're planting it in. And then you always want to like loosen up the roots that are coming around this, like the perimeter of the, the inside the nursery pot. And that's just going to help them kind of explore. How do you I, do that? Oh, just, like, you, you, just you can like mess with them. It? Oh, you can totally mess with them. They're not going to just like, if, if you knock off a couple of roots, it's fine. It's fine. So you like take it out of the plastic container and literally like yeah, your, just, like, I usually fingers. just like will open up the whole thing. I'll usually like like uh, kind of tear it open from the bottom a little bit if it's like a like a very tight uh, root system. But also speaking of which, if it's uh, like more fine root system, like if they have like more lacy roots, like I don't know ferns, uh, peperomias, pepperonis. Pileas. <laughs> you can uh, just tell the root system is just more fine. Well, you would, if you took it out of the pot, like uh, like the ZZ plant has like these chunky roots, like you would see very clearly. But if you were to take, take a pepperoni out of the pot, you wouldn't really see any roots like that. Like it would all just be like kind of like little lacy bits going all throughout the soil. So um, those kinds of plants want to stay smaller and you might not even need to necessarily repot them and they might do better if you just kind of leave them be because they're more used to those settings. But um, I leave wouldn't them go... in the plastic container. Yeah, yeah, you can leave them like the the That's pepperonis I leave. Oh. I've literally people, always was... assumed you put it have to put it in something bigger or it's gonna suffer. No, I wow. say the most important thing is to let your plants acclimate to your home. So when you bring them into your home, let them sit for like two weeks in the setting that you want to have because oh mind you, they're coming from like the nursery, so you don't want to just like put it on like a dark kitchen counter for two <laughs> weeks to acclimate. Like you want it to be like in a good spot, um, and then. Once it's acclimated, like it's probably going to drop a leaf or two, or maybe once you start to see like some new growth coming in, then I would recommend going ahead and repotting it. Just to oh my insert. gosh, I have never like, yeah, I done that. Like, I feel like I've seen people like often would just put um, like the plastic container inside of a nicer, you know, oh yeah, you can absolutely or whatever like that. Yeah, that's called a cash po or a cash pot. Um, it's just a planter without a drainage hole. You never want to plant in a planter without a drainage hole. If you ever see I to put stones in, it's a myth. I put, I put. Oh my god! Okay, now I just want to throw myself off this. So here's the issue balcony. with that: they're just gonna, the water is just gonna sit down in the stones, and it's just gonna get gross, and it's got nowhere to go. I always recommend drilling. I've never broken a pot. I've drilled into hundreds of pots. I've never broken one. Really? Just okay. Like so a single, a single hole out the bottom. Or yeah, like yeah. And then you use something. Um, I, I just one in the bottom. I literally just do a. It's a glass and tile bit, but I think people probably play it safer with like a the diamond saw tip. But I just, yeah. I, like I said, I've never broken one. But um, then you have to put it on a tray. Yeah, but you, you can just get like a nice plate from the thrift store. I don't know. Yeah, okay, okay. No, this is very interesting to me because I, know, I, I didn't know that either. dispelled this myth on this Every po- even on this our- podcast and I've been dragged <laughs> because I was always getting my rocks, putting them at the bottom of my pots, not having holes in the bottom. That's not something I've ever relied on. Just putting repotting the second I brought those plants home. <laughs> I'm rethinking everything right now. So don't necessarily no. repot immediately. I feel like that's like a myth that like BuzzFeed would make or something. Oh but, my right, god, like, I don't want to be BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed. <laughs> I'm BuzzFeed. I'm a millennial oh. piece of shit. Oh my god, stop it. Um, <laughs> if you need to plant into something that you like don't want to drill into it and you absolutely have to plant into it, I'd say do like a quarter inch of horticultural charcoal in the bottom of the planter. Um, and that's it. And then just like use your normal potting mix and then be very mindful of the amount that you like plant your you water like because that's going in there it's not going to yeah, drain it's just okay. sitting there so wow. what and it can suck it back up do? oh it's just gonna keep oh. it clean on the bottom like instead of the rocks oh, throw it's just kind of like, sit and get gross okay. but the charcoal yeah. it's it's going to the soils also because it's so fine it will kind of like mesh with the charcoal mm-hmm. down there so it won't be just like an inch of rocks it'll just be like a little bit of charcoal and then that'll keep any water that's at the bottom clean and then the water can still be reabsorbed back up into the plant and then just None be careful these- 
None know, of these plants in this room have plants. a. Ha, they all have rocks in the bottom of their pots without holes. <laughs> well, you know I've had some they, for years that are fine. Yeah, like yeah, they are yeah. the way they I are. I think I've obviously pl- found an equilibrium with them. So if it's working, yeah. it's like keep it. But I'm just not watering forward. them too much. Exactly. Yeah. It's my issue. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> oh my god, I know. But now I'm just like, oh my lord above heaven. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. I'm going to touch on the research that I did. Mine's not a specific study, but first, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on some of this stuff. So, A, I did not realize that the houseplant industry in America is like almost $2 billion a year, which is insane. And it's definitely like exploded since the pandemic. Um, and then I was finding all these companies. Like, have you heard of The Sill before? I have, yeah. So, I guess there's like that's in America. There's another one in the UK. What's that? I, so, The Sill is basically. A company, it's like an online e-commerce company where you can like order your plants from. So instead of like going to a store, it's like meant to help people who maybe are like totally unfamiliar. It's very like millennial, like easy, you know, like that kind of like aesthetic of like you go and you can pick your plant and they have all these like Pinks cute little and pots. Blues and, yeah, totally. and ceramics. Um, this one company had started, just the still started in 2018. They raised $5 million to start and they sold 100,000 years of that plant, like, sorry, 100,000 plants that year. Um, so I'm just like curious what your thoughts are about like these companies that have started this business. Uh, and is that interesting? Obviously maybe it makes it accessible to people who don't have super easy access to places, but in another way, maybe it's like kind of just falling off of trends and I don't know. I'm curious what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. Like a company like that, I feel like is just kind of like a stepping stone. Like whether you're buying a gift for somebody, it's got everything covered. Or if you are just getting the house plants and you just kind of want like the, a dynamic duo to start out with or something you know what i mean yeah. they're all like tried and true that they sell so it's you know it's a great like stepping stone like i said yeah. so that's kind of just that there are a lot of um e-commerce things going on with house plants lately i think that's sorry i hear i can't tell if there's a sound going on i can't tell if the cat's like chewing on something oh he is he's chewing on the calafia <laughs> we just watched he's right there he's got oh his God. feet he's licking his oh, lips he's like i've been chewing sorry. on that plant but i'm gonna go the action up. national geographic <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. That just totally threw me off. The e- com- oh, e-commerce, no, no. e-commerce. Okay, so <laughs> that's been something that's been like kind of abused lately, like um, uh, Etsy and things like that. I've been noticing like people will go to their local like Home Depot and like purchase, I don't know, like a, f- a, a pepperoni, a pepperoni. They purchase a <laughs> big, they'll purchase a big eight inch pot of a pepperoni. That kind of sounds dirty, but that, I, you know. um, and then <laughs> they'll separate it yeah. into like four inch pots that you would normally see. And then they would resell them on their Etsy wow. and they paid like $15 for that eight inch pot. And then they're just kind of straight up repotting them, which, you know, some people could say it's a way of making money, but it's a little bit different than when you buy in as like when I was a buyer, like I would be buying an established plants that were like bought in. Like, I just feel like it's like malintent. Like it's just, you know, right. It's just not More something that's my, I don't support yeah, it. I openly don't support it on my YouTube channel, okay. but right. people can do whatever they I, want though. So, I was yeah. curious, <laughs> even with these companies, I'm curious, and even with your experience, like just working at a plant store, like what does the industry behind the curtain look like? Like, are there factories of people just growing these plants? Like, are you know, are they coming from specific places? Do you have to reach out to you know, exotic, like, locations for exotic plants or, you know, like, we, we sort of slowly learn about, like, how agriculture works and how there really are just, like, these fields or factories full of animals and flowers for Valentine's Day. It's like, is, do you have any insight into that or is it kind of, like, closed doored? Yeah, um, I would say there are, like, factories. I think that's something that's probably a little bit more overseas. I know in, like, the Netherlands, there's, like, a lot more, like, tissue culture going on, which is, like, the scientific method of uh, propagating or recreating houseplants, or plants in general, but they use it a lot for houseplants. Um, In America, it's definitely more of just, like, a nursery thing. Like, people are getting in their plugs that they're purchasing from these factories that are creating these tissue culture plants. They're potting them in their four, six, eight-inch pots, and they are just letting them grow out from there in their nurseries. Uh, It can be in Florida. There's places I used to buy from in Canada even. So, you know what I mean? It's shocking that there's be like, you know, a lot of plants grown up there, but they do. (laughs) A lot of plants come from Canada. So a lot of cool ones. Okay, cool. Awesome. So they're growing them in greenhouses. They're growing them in greenhouses. Yes. And outside, outside too, like uh, under shade cloths in like Florida. Oh, I see. Like they are outside, but they have like a controlled environment. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. Remember you had looked into that research about like how solar panels and plants can work together. Like the solar panels can provide like certain types of shade. Yeah. Yeah. Can. There's like, there's certain crops that they think will grow even better right directly underneath solar panels and then also help with the energy efficiency of the solar panels. That is so interesting. That's, maybe not. I know. Plants, I don't know. It was probably like, it was not house like plants. Crops. It was actually like yeah. tomato plants. It was like, oh, it was wow. like they were trying to figure out how to, you know, farm both the sun's energy and farm for like vegetation and food. That really cool. makes me really curious. As somebody who owns so many house plants, are you interested in like gardening? Like, would you ever own like a tomato plant for its, you know what I mean? Like the way it looks, or does that feel like it's too much work or maybe not the right environment? Well, um, I did that when I was younger. That's how I got into plants. But I think why I'm so into houseplants now is because it's just not really like uh, feasible for me in the city. Like I have a very small outdoor space. We have a courtyard like shared with my two neighbors, but um, uh, it's just so heavily shaded and it's all the buildings right. and stuff. Like it's just not something like I could probably grow like heavy, heavy shade stuff, but like I just right. throw my houseplants out there. So um, one day, but honestly, I think I'm a city boy, so I think I'm going to be here for a pretty long time. So I don't <laughs> think I'm going to have that kind of space, but I'm not not down with it. Like You're not, I'm saying, <laughs> you're not like, against. You're not anti. <laughs> yes, no. Anti-vegetation. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, well, I have a few more like final questions, but I want to bring up like the question for all of us just to answer is like the environmental impact of like people being so much more curious. Like obviously there is this idea of it is so nice. Like as we bring plants into even our own home, I felt like more connected to nature and you become more present and aware of those things. I think at least that's like anecdotally how I feel, but I was just trying to like look into it, trying to figure out what, especially these companies, like the criticisms were that, you know, you're adding a lot of like plant miles, like having to travel from different places, um, you know, every time someone orders a plant, like putting it on a truck or putting it wherever and traveling it across the world, uh, apparently like plastic pots are not often recyclable though. Now we know we can probably just like use those and not have to destroy them. But you know what I mean? You get those plastic pots, they're either black or they're contaminated and not recyclable. And the last thing was peat. I didn't, I don't know much about peat, you know, like, I guess it's like a material that you use to help plants grow. Is that yes. what that is? Yes. Peat um, but it was like, that can take, uh, thousands of years to form. It's just like decomposed plant matter, but the industry can like extract 500 years worth of growth in a year. So obviously as this industry for house plants booms and I, I don't know if peat is used in like re regular vegetation or if it just is like, like in the house plant industry, it was interesting. I, w I, I, I feel like plants can bring so much awareness to people, not so much awareness, but at least sort of like a cognitive connection to nature, especially if you're not in a city where you have access. But obviously I was like, just trying to think like, how can it be a sustainable industry? Or one day will we be like, oh my God, the plant industry is also destroying the earth, which would <laughs> oh feel very God. ironic. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, things that I try to do, like when I was a buyer, I went out of my way to buy local. I had three people that I bought from that were within like 50 miles. So that was really important to me. Of course, That's every cool. now and again, I would truck in something from Florida and truck in something from Canada, just kind of like, you know, keep things fresh because business. But right. people want like, yeah. Yeah, but I did, was very mindful trying to keep everything as local as possible, all of our Oil was local. So that was things that, you know, as a small business, I really wanted to like kind of play into. Uh, I like that you said the peat thing. That is something that is uh, kind of not really known about a lot. And honestly, I don't think I know even as much as I should know about that. But it is a, a mind resource that it's mined from bogs and it is yeah. something in all all purpose soil. And a lot of people are trying to switch over to either growing plants um, hydroponically or semi hydroponics, they call it, which is like with Leca pebbles, which is like a, a puffed um, aggregate, like kind of like clay sort of thing. It's, it looks like cocoa puffs. So you can grow plants in that. And then cocoa coir, coconut coir is much more um, resourceful than uh, peat, which is another like, thing that you can literally wow. just replace your peat mm -hmm. with and yeah. i'm guilty i don't really go out of my way to do it and it's something i should do because i'm just so used to just buying a big bag of potting soil right, when the i'm the way that it is yeah, yeah. and so i wait hydroponics is that when you grow like just in water or without soil just in water um so you you it, it is soilless in water so technically if you're just like putting like a pothos cutting in a jar of water that's hydroponics in a sense so okay yeah <laughs> right but um, i think it's really easy to grow plants hydroponically because they don't have all that heavy soil to just kind of wither away in if you rot them so right, tip, like i think we might have talked about this but um if you have a really dark corner you can just plop like a cutting in water and it'll do 10 
10 times better than if you were to throw oh, it in a pot wow. in a dark corner. Because the wow. soil does what? I literally have no idea. This is just okay, something just I have learned from experience. Okay. Oh my gosh. It is really that. interesting. It's kind of not what you would think. Uh -huh. Well, they don't wow. seem to rot. Like if you're changing the water out every like month or two, right. people probably say once a week that you should, but I do like every couple months. And it just seems to take care of itself versus, you know, in soil, it can dry out or be too wet for too long. And the roots just kind of seem to acclimate. But are you going to have a luscious plant? No, but I've had like a little <laughs> pothos cutting up on one of my dark shelves that has looked exactly the same for three years, and uh, okay. it's and it very stays much alive. In, like, the hyd would you ever transfer wow. a hydroponic plant to, into soil one day? You could. Um, you would probably want to do that within like six months, or maybe like a year, just because those roots are different. They're because okay. you know they're the way they grow. Yes, they're not soil roots, so they would have to readjust. So if your plant's like overgrown in water, it's something that I you know probably not the best yeah. thing to do. That's so interesting. I I mean I get what you're saying. But the environmental impacts because it just feels like, you know, well, this like is a big question for me. I was like, yeah, I, like I've never thought about what goes in, even just that question about the industry, like being like, yeah. I'm, I'm so blind to like where our how was plants or even come the from. cell. Like it's interesting. We live in Toronto where there are so many local plant stores, so we just go to our local plant store to buy yeah. them. But it's like I never really thought about how there could even be a website like the cell and in such an industry around this. But obviously, if it's taking off and one point eight billion dollar industry like that's pretty <laughs> incredible i just have yeah. this thing though where i'm like so many things have such an economic and like like cost to our planet it just is like it's, it's so it feels measure. like so like want want to go in hard on them no, <laughs> like, I know. Yeah. Of, all, of all the industries it feels yeah. like the one to be like it's probably we shouldn't focus on this one but first. but it's <laughs> always important to think about those things yeah i think about like conservationism like a lot of these plants are things that could be extinct in the wild and hopefully that's not because people were poaching them but you know <laughs> th th things like that i think is kind of fun <laughs> to just like enjoy growing them <laughs> There's, you know it's definitely always a bad thing that you can think about for yeah the cost bad of things for one truly thing, everything but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. anything um i i like do you have any more plant advice questions no no go it i can see i your just wanted to know good. like okay a couple like last minute blast questions like yeah. what are your most hated plants <gasps> oh my gosh <laughs> i did a whole video about plants i don't like um i think <laughs> I my <thought> <laughs> My least. You think he was gonna be I like, I, like I can't possibly. Change. You're like, well, I've actually gone in hard and done how many how the ones I. Hate. Yeah, I I definitely have plants I don't like. I just think a lot of plants are overrated and that people are just kind of like sheep when it comes to a lot of these plants. I hate to say it, but there's one in particular. <laughs> it's called the philodendron birkin. I feel like I drag the hell out of this thing on my channel all the time, but it's a plant that was literally manufactured to be like popular and expensive. I mean, they called it birkin, like a birkin bag. Is it so. literally birkin, oh, like a birkin bag? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, barf me up to Carolina. Right? And it's so <laughs> stupid because it looks like this house plant that, it, it looks like a philodendron congo, which is like a $5 plant. And then uh, it looks also like a canna lily, which is also like a $5 plant mixed into one. And it's just like, they tried, but they failed, but they're just like, oh, let's just slap a Birkin on it and just see if people like respond oh to it. Oh my God, the Cadillac, <laughs> next thing you know, the Cadillac, the Tesla. Oh my God, the <laughs> plant. Oh my God, wow. So that's like my, my, my most hated house plant. There are some others too that I think are a little overrated, like alocasia and stuff, elephant ears, which are just like not suitable for indoor growth. It's like a patio plant, but people are like freaking out over these little ones that are like four inches tall and cost them like oh, $150. Like I just, I don't get it. Like I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> I'm, I think a lot of people get into like, you know, it's because it's trendy. A lot of people get into this right. like knee deep with like, I need rare plants. I need like the rare, the most expensive thing. And I feel like those are the people who are gonna fall out of this within like a year yeah, or two. Yeah, they just get excited by that. And you had kind of pointed <laughs> out in one of your videos, I watch how often like plants start out as really expensive, but then when they become the trend, suddenly it's like they're not worthless, but it's like well, they start out expensive. Yes, the Philadelphia Birkin, back at, once upon a time, it cost like $150, <laughs> but I would be selling them for like $12, $15 when I left the house plant wow. store back in October. So it's like, Within a year, it just took a plummet. Also, another great example of that is the Pilea pepperomioides, if you guys are familiar with that. They call it the friendship or the pancake plant as well. And I think that, we have one of those, yeah. Ah, they're super <laughs> cute. But um, they used to cost a lot of money once again. Not like as ex exponential as a lot of the things now because plants just did not cost a lot of money like three or four years ago. 
uh, but still like a little two inch pot would go for like fifty dollars, which nowadays <gasps> that's something that would sell for like two fifty. Yeah. Wow, thousand. I love that plant. Yeah, it's cute. They're that's super cute. cute, but they just weren't available on in our continent. Like they were grown in Europe and oh, right. they were mass produced over there, but it just wasn't something that was in the American market. And so that's once it hit, it was like a slow trickle. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. That literally is my Birkin right now. And they are so cheap. Our corner store has them, and they are like literally a few bucks for like a a little. I one. can't believe they called a plant a Birkin and sold it for a bunch of money, and now it's worthless. <laughs> I know, isn't that so funny? Literally, it's it had it so coming. Literally, literally like, like, it's Freud capitalism out. in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah literally. Literally. let's find a way to make this so expensive, and then in five years, everyone will be like, that's literally worth. I hope that happens to Birkin bags. <laughs> I hope that everyone just like gets embarrassed and we're like, wow, look at that trash and expensive bag. Uh, okay, my last question, and I think you just had a video on this, so you can lean off of that. But like, what do you see as the biggest trends? for 2021 or the plants that are kind of like up and coming slash hot? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good question. I felt like my video that I talked about that recently was about plants that would be like on the market, but I don't think they're ones that necessarily will be popular. Okay. Um, oh my gosh, that is such a good question. I have not thought about that. And I'm like scanning around the room <laughs> trying to You're find like, a possible <laughs> answer to this. Um, I don't like, know. Is it like in the plant industry, do you feel like it's like... Um, I feel like, you know, when you're in the fashion industry, all these, like, it's like the certain communities get it first and are like so excited. And then eventually it's just like everywhere. And in it's some like, design circles, like colors, like what colors mm -hmm. come in and out of fashion are like chosen. Like, like they actually decide like this, like and then millennial you see pink. That scale down, yeah. Like, throughout the years. Yeah. So there's not a larger resource deciding like which is the Birkin of the year. <laughs> no, no. And I almost wonder sometimes, like, I don't think so, but I wonder if it's like plant influencers like me who almost like, set the trend sometimes which right. I hope not because that's not what I want <laughs> but I just want people to like what they like but sometimes I just hope that you know or I wonder I hope I was gonna say I hope not not that I hope I wonder if they're like looking at these plants and being like I want that because I just want to share information but I would don't want people to see 10 plants then suddenly want to buy 10 plants because they saw them huh. on the video right. That's, That's interesting. That's <laughs> yeah. so interesting. We find out that you're actually the person deciding the trends. And you don't even realize. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it, you know, it could work to your favor. I know that I'm not trying to throw shade, and I'm not going to say any names. But there are a lot of like other houseplant influencers who have their own like online stores. So they're probably just like, I have this plant, right. and wow. you can buy this can on my shop yeah. for fifty five dollars. Okay, <laughs> you can name names on this podcast. No, oh, I'm no, not going to. You want to? <laughs> What's his community? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell us Start after. a drama in the plant community. Oh my gosh, I am like the black sheep. I mean, like that's very. I think that's very endearing to call me the black sheep, actually. But myself, but I just don't talk to anybody. I like don't speak to anybody. I think I told you much. I'm like so nervous of being so lame. Like I think house plants are so lame, and I get worried that like a lot of the people who like are into them or like, I don't know. Like I mean, all my no. friends are cool, uh, but I get so scared. Yeah, no. I get so scared no, it's sometimes. Fair. Like I think it's a fair like assessment. Like we talk about influencers, we talk about YouTubers and like as a breed, you find cool ones every now and then, but there's lots of people out there that are, can be super cringy. And so I, I would imagine in your own community, you'd be like, are these people just trying to capitalize on this? Are they genuinely into plants? But I'm sure there are like the ones out there that are actually Cool. And yeah. Meet oh, them yeah. One day. I'll find them. I'll find like, them. Like, or I'm maybe not. Or maybe not. Or maybe they <laughs> are <laughs> all <laughs> literally. Lame. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I can count on one hand the influencers I've met that I'm like, you're actually a normal person, <laughs> <laughs> and you're one of them. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Yes, I'm, I promise I'm chill. I'm gonna hang out and smoke some weed and have a couple margaritas tonight. <laughs> oh so. my gosh, yeah. Oh, I have to dream. tell our audience what happened. Like, we had filmed our video last time, and then at the end, can I drag you with this? Yeah. Like, it's okay if I tell. This. At yeah. the end, Nick messaged me. He was like, I accidentally bumped the camera. And so for like the last part of the video, you can just see my roommate's bong sitting in the background. I was like, that's okay, totally I think we're okay. okay today. I think I'm Our them. channel is very, you know, 420 friendly. Our podcast, oh, Greg, is, Greg, is very 420 friendly. Oh, oh wow, throw me under the 420. <laughs> act like you are. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just like you are. <laughs> yeah, recently we were like reading a book about changing habits. And it was like the first thing you need to do is change your cultural identity. And I'm like, well, I actually really like being a stoner. So I guess I'm not giving it. <laughs> like, like, I was just like, culturally, it's like, I like it. So maybe that's my main issue. If I, ever I don't think you have stop. to change anything. 
Yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, guess that habit's not going. We'll move on to something else. Um, Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube slash whatever link you include with this podcast. (laughs) I will give it to you. It's Nick Pelleggi Plants. And I'm at Philly Foliage on Instagram. Wait, I bet. What is it? Philly Foliage? Philly Foliage. Wait, spell that out. I live in Philadelphia. Okay. So it's like, it's okay. like if, if, if I was going to have a brand one day, that's my brand. Philly yeah, foliage. okay, hey, Philly Foliage. Right. Is the foliage a PH? No, oh my God. Uh, oh, Greg, yeah. you're not supposed to ask me that. Oh, <laughs> no. Be, no, 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 I wouldn't have liked that. Like I wouldn't have liked that. It's an F. Yeah, no, no, no. It's the way it should be. It's F. It's the way it should be. That's what I'm saying. If you had said it was PH, I would have been like, embarrassing mistake. That would just mean that I didn't get there soon enough and I lost the URL. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we really appreciate all of your advice. Um, Thank thanks you. for being on the pod. Thanks for making the video with me. I'm excited for it to come out. I'm about to drill holes in the bottom of all my pods. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> this weekend, Greg's definitely just going to be like, <laughs> like <laughs> freaking out. It's like, oh have gosh, you ever used fine. a drill? We you're don't know fine. how to use a drill in this house. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone else, for listening. Hashtag Silent Podcast. If you want to talk about plants with us, if you want to tweet or Instagram Nick and ask your questions, I'm going to put them out there that he can answer them for you because <laughs> we certainly can't. Uh, and we will talk to you guys next week. Peace. Bye.